So welcome to the Data Across Boundaries workshop. Um, my name is Oscar Alec. I'm the chair um, and the uh, co-organizer or organizer of the workshop. Uh, with me today is also Angus Forbes, uh, who is um, my my mentor at the Creative Coding Lab, and we are both based at uh, UC Santa Cruz. Um, the the workshop is a part of uh, a cross symposium, which is which is an event organized by by the cross um, by the cross uh, organization, which is a center for research in open source software, based also here at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and yeah, so I'll I'll start <clears throat> with a short introduction about myself. Um, so I'm a I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at UC Santa Cruz and also a cross incubator fellow. Um, incubator fellow means that I have been uh, tasked or um, you know granted uh, support for developing a piece of open source software uh, which is called Polyform. So I'll give you a very brief intro about that. Um, so Polyform is is a data scientific and visualization software that started in the astrophysics background. Um, basically, we, our intention was to develop uh, a way to reconstruct the, the cosmic web, which is uh, an intergalactic um, kind of web or network of, of uh, filaments of gas and dark matter. Um, and since then, which was two years ago, the software kind of grew into into a bigger thing on its own. Um, we're also making some art with it, as you can as you can see here. So this whole this whole package, we we had an idea to develop it as a as an open source project and make it available uh, to to broader uh, community of, of scientists, both uh, you know data scientists and domain specific scientists. And so that's that's kind of my main uh, work right now, and Cross is supporting that. So the moving on to the to the workshop. So what is data across boundaries? So the idea for the workshop was um, finding an overlap between uh, open source development practices and open scientific uh, practices. Um, specifically, you know, we we come from the visualization or data visualization and scientific visualization background. And um, that's also where uh, our speakers today um, kind of have their um, their working. Although all our speakers are actually, um, you know, domain domain specialists, and and so this overlap between the need to 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 find um, to interpret data to you know to to abstract from them and to use them to to communicate between different scientific domains. Uh, is kind of what motivated this workshop. Um, so I just I just have a few kind of sciences listed here, and um, these these arrows represent just just the needs to to exchange knowledge, and that knowledge typically has the form of, of data today. Um, all our speakers come from uh, one of these or even multiple disciplines, and across our across their their career, they have to. Um, Find ways to, to gain insights into their into their data sets, um, and also to 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 exchange um, what um, you know what these data mean to, to kind of communicate it between each other um, and even across domains. Similarly, in open source development, um, you have organizations that um, that interface with each other. Using using code and, and data as a as a platform as a medium, um, you have you know different entities, you have corporations, you have academic and research uh, institutions, as well as independent developers, and all of these people need to somehow communicate and and coordinate together and organize to develop open source software. So. Um, Clearly, there is a lot of shared problems in these uh, uh, in these examples. Um, how to design, you know, protocols or or how to communicate uh, things that that are that differ between different 
entities or between different disciplines. Um, in science, it's it's language that often differs, even if it refers to the same things. In open source, it might be formats and uh, and languages that people use, as well as practices in in any given entity. And so the main question that you know this workshop addresses is how to how to actually learn from one another, how to how to actually share knowledge about bridging these these different disparate disciplines and and issues. And so our speakers today um, are uh, all involved in scientific research in one way or another. Um, they all have to face these issues: how to how to gather data, how to process them in a transparent way, and how to communicate them in a in a way that's uh, unbiased or hopefully unbiased, and um, you know makes makes the point that that they are trying to make when when uh, talking about their research to experts, but especially to non-experts. Um, in today's day and age, we have a lot of needs to to actually communicate our science to um, to the general public uh, as the form of as a form of outreach. And maybe more than than any other time, it's needed for the science or for this communication to be transparent. And so we all try to do that in some way. So um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to give you uh, the first the first speaker. Uh, that uh, the first speaker is Dr. Uh, Jing Shu. Uh, she's a research scientist at uh, UCSE Genomics Institute, and um, she her her expertise is in developing uh, tools for visualizing genomics data and communicating them. Uh, to to other scientists. Um, so, without further ado, let me let me share the talk. And Dr. Zhu will tell us about a tool called UCSC Zena. The, Oscar, if I, um, I can actually play it off of this computer if you're having problems with the audio. I did have time to download it. Okay. Um, can you hear the Can you hear the audio? No. From the video. Oh. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. I guess I just need to reshare. Yeah. Okay. So you have Stephanie. I said, if you want me to, to run it off of this computer, I can. Okay, yeah, sure. Let me just get that set up a little bit. Yeah, Zoom is, Zoom is doing Zoom things again. Hello, my name is Jing Zhu. Uh, I'm a research scientist here at the Genomics Institute. I'll be presenting our project UCSC Zena today. Uh, so UCSC Zena is a web browser-based data visualization and exploration tool for multi-omics cancer genomics data. Our users dynamically build uh, views of the data that they want to see using our tool online. Uh, we got started uh, to develop Xena um, because we were part of the TCGA project sponsored by the NCI. So TCGA stands for the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, this is a project done by many groups uh, together across the U.S., including here at Santa Cruz, uh, led by uh, Dr. Josh Stewart. Um, so using a uniform set of experimental um, essays and as well as the computational uh, pipelines, the project generated a comprehensive profiling of uh, genomic landscapes uh, for greater, more than 12,000 tumor samples across 33 
cancer types. So this is one of the most important cancer genomics data sets for cancer research. Uh, so not only the data is genome wide, which means the profile, the profile is done for all the genes in the genome, not just a few hundreds that we know are relevant to, in cancer so far. Uh, in addition, the data is multi-omic. What that means is for each tumor samples, there are multiple data mutalities, including um, mutation profile, gene expression, the copy number profile, and et cetera. So this uh, amazing data resource generated many landmark publications, and the data actually has been public for many years uh, through a, a public available data portal. Uh, however, the data uh, in large part exist and hundreds of thousands of individual files. So here are just the stats for one of the cancer type, the TCG breast cancer cohort. And this many of just text uh, files make it really hard for uh, biologists, in particular uh, the bench biologists, to, to explore the data, to validate their own analysis results using this amazing data set. So the goal of uh, the UCSC Zinc project is to develop an online interactive tool to enable cancer researchers to, um, uh, to explore the data, to visualize the data, uh, to transfer something from hundreds of thousands of cells into something that they can um, interactively view and analyze, analyze and integrate uh, uh, over an online platform. In fact, we since the TCGA, we uh, have uh, incorporated uh, more than 10 major cancer genomics projects. Um, those data is available on our on our two uses in the browser as well. So in summary, that uh, one of the strengths of Xena is um, to enable cancer researchers to really easily visualize uh, large public resource data sets. Um, so far in, uh, in total, we have uh, more than 127 study cohorts uh, on our platform. Um, but not all cancer data are public. In fact, uh, many, uh, much, much of the cancer data are not. So we, so in addition to view public data, our two also enable users to securely view their own private data as well. And this is achieved by Zena's uh, hub and browser architecture. So for the Zena platform, there are two major components. The first one uh, is uh, Zena data hubs, showing here on the, in the slide as this green or the red Data, uh, database icons. So their purpose is the serving genomics data uh, out based on the incoming query. And the second component uh, of the Xena platform is the Xena browser, which is the, the web browser-based application run on top, like a Chrome uh, or Firefox or Safari web browsers. Uh, so the browser can uh, auto, uh, simultaneously connect to multiple data hubs. The data are combined in the browser to ensure data security. So I just go into this architecture a little bit more in detail. So for public data, we put them uh, in the public hub set in the in the cloud. Uh, but the same um, hub software, the exactly same software, can be installed also on users' personal computers, such as their laptops, across all the commonly used operating systems. So user load their data into the hub and then view that using the same Xena browser, just like they view the TCGA data. Um, so the local hub piece is entirely a point of click, um, has an entirely point of click interface. Uh, there are no command line skills are required to so make that very easy for bench biologists to use to view their own data and to view that in a, in a secured uh, manner. So because we're focused on multi omic cancer genomics data, our visualizations on Xena are particular uh, very good at putting different type of genomic data side by side. In fact, we can visualize virtually 
any type of uh, uh, functional genomics data, including the common, common data types such as mutation, gene expression, copy number data, as well as some of the less common data types, for example, the TNA methylation profile, uh, the chromatin accessibility profile, uh, assay by tax seek, and etc. Uh, so the so the characteristic visualization of Xena is what we call the Xena visual spreadsheet. Uh, like office spreadsheet, um, the visualization have rows and columns. Here a row represents a single bio entity. So this could be a single tumor cell, a tumor sample, a single cell, a single cell line. And the, the columns here uh, in our visual spreadsheet are different slices of the genomics data. And the single row across the entire display, across all the columns, are genomic information from that single sample. So showing here is a screenshot of one of those uh, spreadsheets um, where you're looking at the TCGA prostate cancer uh, cohorts data. We have about 500 tumor samples in this study cohort. And we, we show a vertical bar here that, that give the user a sense of um, how many samples are in that little bit of vertical space. And the different columns here are different type of genomics data. For example, column C is the, the copy number data, B and E are expression data, and column F is the mutation data. <coughs> so Sena is really good at uh, looking at hundreds of samples, thousands of samples, even or, or tens of thousands of samples, all their genomics data together in, um, in this small vertical space very compactly. And then maybe you already can see that just a bird's eye view that you already see that um, there's some visual patterns across the data columns. For example, the mutation profile of this gene called SPOP, there's a strong correlation with a gene expression of a different gene called an ERG that the actually is a mutual exclusivity between the presence of the mutation and overexpression of ERG. So so this type of visualization, like visual spreadsheets, is really great and integrate multi-omics data by placing data columns side by side, allow user to interact like, to uh, explore and query and identify patterns exist in the genomics data. So it might surprise you that this view is actually a combination of both a data served from the public hub as well as the user's private hub running uh, on their own laptop. So here, column B is user's own uh, private analysis results, and the data from column C to F are retrieved from the public Xena hub that we stand up in the cloud. So in addition to visual spreadsheet, we also have uh, several other type of visualizations. The first one showing here is the Kaplan-Meier survival plot. So this plot allow our users to evaluate any genomic uh, data uh, against survival. For example, they can ask questions such as, is overexpression this gene or a mutation of this gene, is that correlated with better or worse overall survival? We also have many interactive chart mode, uh, that user can generate box plus, get a plot bar chart, et cetera, and on our browser, and all uh, come with a statistic, statistic automatically computed at the same time. Um, we enable user to run genome-wide analysis directly from our browser, uh, such as uh, um, genome-wide gene expression analysis. And here showing on the right, is a 3D UMAP embedding view of the multi, highly um, multi-dimensional uh, data set that is um, shown in the 3D UMAP manifold embedding. Um, so our usage has been steadily increasing over the years. We published uh, Xena in Nature Biotechnology last year. And what you're seeing here is the typical uh, usage stats from uh, this year. 
For example, in May, uh, we served 36,000 user sessions to cancer researchers from 94 different countries. Uh, and we delivered 4.2 terabytes of compressed data download to our users. Uh, so those are local data hubs that user run on their Mac or Windows computer to see their own private data were initiated more than 1,600 times uh, just in the month of May alone. We also emphasize usability. What that means is we interview a user to understand their use case before we build a new visualization, uh, as well as during the development and after the prototype development. And they also means that we watch user to use our website or our prototypes to resolve the, uh, the pain point um, of their usage. Uh, we developed a lot of uh, training and outreach materials in uh, uh, tutorial videos or tutorial slides. Uh, we conduct multiple virtual in-person workshops each year. Uh, we communicate with, uh, to, with our user uh, through Twitter, uh, public forum, or private mailing list. So our project is also open source, and the entire code base is on GitHub. Uh, we were part of the uh, Google Summer of Code um, uh, activity for a couple of years. And more recently, we started uh, the Xena mentorship program for uh, underrepresented students. So this is sponsored by uh, CCI's Essential Open Source Software for Science program. Uh, we're currently in the phase of setting up training materials and working on the process to recruit UCIC underrepresented students. And we're really excited about the project um, that I hope we can recruit some great students uh, to expand our team's diversity as well as diversity of the open source uh, software development community. And with that, and then I want to thank our entire Xena development team as well as our funding sources. Thank you, and thank you for your time for listening to me today. Thank you, Jing. Um, so uh, the, the way how we'll handle questions is uh, we'll have very quick questions uh, kind of specific to the talk. And, and then during the panel, we'll discuss more general and, and overall big things. So uh, feel free to ask during the talks uh, and the speakers can also respond in chat. And um, yeah, for longer things, we'll just delay them until, until the panel discussion. So a question from uh, Alex. Uh, if you could talk a bit about the unexpected experience that came from making Xena available to such a large group of people, how did you how did you upscale this project? Um, in many years, um, things maybe now doesn't seem to be unexpected because we've been doing this for quite a few years. Um, but I do, but thinking back, you know, at the early on days, um, I guess because I'm not coming from a background of product development, but what we're essentially doing is building a product for um, cancer genomics researchers. So the things I do, I think I learned um, maybe one of the most important things now thinking back is the UX part of the work. UX represent user experience. So it's a part of the things I would talk about on usability. Um, at the early on, I think when the project started, even before this put a cancer browser, which is a, uh, the first, before Xena, the first generation, it's, it's mostly started when I was a postdoc. So it's like a postdoc project. You're building some tools, and you, then you get grants to further develop that. But it's in the form of you develop something and then you show people your results and, and, and then you make modifications. We got pretty lucky that um, our, our work continued and continue to get funded, continue to get used. But I think now going back, 
And especially now when we're building new visualizations, we sort of didn't do it in the right order. The right order really, in my opinion, now should be you actually to go to your target users, the cancer researchers, to talk to them, to understand their problem, to find their needs. And then you build wireframes. They're not even a code, just designs. So we have a design user UX engineer in our team. And, and then take the prototypes to test it out. And then the next thing probably is you're building the code and you refine the prototype. So I would say that's not unexpected to me anymore. That's just, um, that's become more natural now. Um, but that's something I definitely learned. Um, big lesson learned through the, the project. Okay. Um, that's a great lesson. Yeah. Um, hard, um, still hard to do. I mean, going back, still, still is it's easy to just say you're gonna do that, but really doing it, it's 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 still, um, yeah, it's still part of the process. Gotcha. Do, do well, we have, uh, we have questions, or uh, there's a couple more. Um, in the I mean, chat. it's you know, I I I think it's a good idea to keep the discussion going. So, um, yeah, if people are interested let's, let's just continue taking questions um okay. maybe maybe just start with matthew's question because it seems uh, connected okay. to the previous one so was there a moment um when you realized you're engaged in product development and how did that change the next steps you took not sure if there's a particular moment it just gradually i think over the time like like i said earlier it's um um, also, actually, I take it back. I think it actually it's because our team. So we, we actually is a really small team. So I'm the PI of the team. Um, um, also servants and bioinformaticians, data wranglers, and writing grants. And we have engineer, software engineer, but we also have um, a UX engineer. And then that's her her task. Like she has many, you know, has to wear. But one of them, two of them are supporting our users for our current project, like tools we already developed, but also uh, talk to users to find their needs finding for new new tools. So I think having um, that uh, member in, in our groups really uh, pushed me you know, to think a lot about these kind of things. So I'm so really, really grateful we have this, this is a great team. Um, so yeah, our response to when we realize we're actually building products to, you know, we're not making, we're not a commercial product, academic product for researchers, is you you really need to build tools for your users. It's not, you're sit, sitting there to think, um, partially it, it's, it's, it's a combination of both what I we think is important, but a lot of them is really go out to your users to, to understand what they're doing, what's their workflow is, and you're trying to develop tools, not just solving an immediate problem, but actually identify the needs and solving the need, like a sort of fulfilling the need, not just like, oh, I need a, I need a ladder to, to, to reach something. You really need to identify they have a need to, to, to reach the thing on the top of the shelf. It's, the problem is not they don't have the ladder, is you need to figure out what they're really trying to trying to do, <laughs> and then trying to fulfill the needs. So. All right. Uh, well, thank you for thank you for answering that. Uh, we have another question from Angus, uh, but I think we should actually move on. I can answer so, that over through the chat. Actually, uh, Stephanie just told me that we have a document which we prepared. Um, so I'm just pasting that in chat. So you can actually paste your questions into this into this Q&A document. Um, you will, um, yeah, you will see the, the, the Thursday section down there. So um, yeah, whoever has a question that can be answered online, just please paste it there. And then the speakers who already uh, finished or who are, you know, whose video we're just playing can answer it just right there. Um, so, yeah, thank you again, Ning, uh, uh, this is uh, this is very interesting and relevant for what we're looking here. Um, so the next talk, uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. or Professor Matthew uh, J. Turk. Uh, he's, a, he's an assistant professor at 
um, University of Illinois in Urbana, uh, Champaign, Cham Champaign, I guess. Um, and he's currently, his, his appointment is in astronomy, uh, but he has a background in, in uh, physics and then also visualizing uh, data from different domains like material science, um, um, even crop sciences, very interesting. And uh, Matthew's main main project right now is is called YT, which is a library or an entire ecosystem level of visualizing physically meaningful data from astronomy and astrophysics. Um, and so, without further ado, um, I give a stage to Matthew. Hi, my name is Matthew Turk, and I am uh, delighted to give a talk today at uh, the uh, Cross workshop on data across boundaries. Um, I'm at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois. Uh, before I begin, I want to say thank you for inviting me to give this talk today. I am completely honored to participate in this. Um, as a little bit of background, I'm a computational astrophysicist by training. Um, I developed simulation platforms and analysis tools for computational astrophysics. And I've worked in interdisciplinary applications, uh, and I study community practice in open source scientific software. And currently, I'm tenure track at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois, where I'm working to develop and implement a grammar of volumetric analysis. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce why we might be interested in studying data storytelling, uh, what we've learned, how we might be applying that, uh, and some of the theory and practice and why it's important. I want to give credit to uh, folks that I've worked with, uh, particularly here at the University of Illinois, like uh, Sam Walkow, uh, who's going to show up uh, during this talk, as well as uh, my colleague, Professor Kate McDowell uh, at the School of Information Sciences, uh, as well as uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, some work that's being done in the YT community, uh, which is made up of a large community of users and developers uh, and uh, is uh, overseen by a steering committee, uh, the names of which I put up here. So before I get too far in, I want to give a cartoon history of the universe in order to situate us here where we are in the universe. Um, after recombination, so when the universe had expanded, the electrons had, uh, the, all the free electrons had gone back onto their atoms. Um, the universe was in a nearly but not completely homogeneous state, um, seeded with instabilities and few residual electrons. Uh, then early on, dark matter clumps collected, formed halos that drew in baryonic material, uh, which converted potential energy into thermal energy, which heated this baryonic matter, which then shed the thermal energy through radiative processes. Uh, these then collapse, become fully molecular through three-body interaction, form an accretion disk, and then ultimately we get a star. Um, in an environment absent of heavy elements, the mechanisms which gas can cool are very limited. In particular, uh, the principal coolant is molecular hydrogen, which forms by electron association and then through three-body interactions. So you might have a couple atoms of hydrogen that hit, form a molecule, uh, and then one of them acts as a catalyst and gets spit back out. Um, this begins in an excited state, then collisionally de-excites, spins off, and heats the gas. You might be wondering why I'm setting the stage like this, uh, and I want to say that it's because I want to uh, set the, the boundary so that we understand where we're talking when we say, uh, when we talk about visualization and analysis. I like to start with a quote from uh, one of my favorite people, Stuart Levy, that we tell lies to visualize. Um, this is a statement that uh, perhaps requires some unpacking, but let's imagine that we were to say that the sky is full of stars that twinkle. And in our minds, we imagine this. Uh, we imagine the sky, we draw a box here, um, maybe it's dark out, I guess it must be if we're looking at the stars. Uh, it is then full of stars. Uh, those stars we can imagine in our, uh, in our mind's eye as you know, perhaps pulsating or something uh, that we then say that these stars twinkle, they grow up and down. And when we look out at those, our eye is interpreting what we see and it is telling us some subset of information about the, uh, the data that uh, reflects the physical characteristics of the system. Uh, in fact, when we look at telescope observations, this is a famous telescope observation, uh, those telescope observations uh, are filtered through the, pro the data processing methods that pr uh, produce something that is suitable for human eyes to see and look at. So we've got an eye and you know, our nebula is shooting out rays of light. Those rays of light maybe get to our eye and then our eye, through its rods and cones, interprets them through different uh, you know, sensitivity functions and so on, converts that into something that our 
neural cortex can see, our visual cortex can uh, process and interpret, and that we then uh, ascribe information to, uh, that we ascribe some sort of a model to. So when we think about this from the reverse direction, the universe, uh, broadly speaking, can be thought of as being made up of a number of different rules and components. And when I set the stage earlier on with the dark matter and so on, uh, what I was doing was attempting to convey some of the initial conditions and some of the rules uh, that we often go through when we are simulating astrophysical phenomena. Uh, and I like to have these pictures up because uh, they're really pretty and they show uh, how clouds can uh, uh, how we can identify clouds uh, that are connected to, say, simulation inputs. So we know how fluid flows, and these are some equations of fluid motion. And in principle, we know if we know how uh, gas and fluid move, and we know exactly what they're made up of, and we know the different rules, we could, in principle, toss all of that into a box and then turn the crank on the side of the box. But we then need to interpret that. So, for example, we can toss all of our fluid flows in here, uh, we can update our uh, simulation over time, and then we can watch as it changes and evolves, and then we can correlate that with some piece of information that we see or observe in the natural uh, world. So, in this way, we can connect both the forward and the inverse problems uh, that we are, we are interested in understanding. But when people are doing this, what uh, exactly do they do? When somebody simulates uh, a, a, phenom a natural phenomenon, what exactly do they do then to understand it? What stories do they tell themselves? So Sam Walkow has been conducting an investigation into this data storytelling process by which people describe how they find, uh, clarify, and then communicate stories from their data to themselves. So our understanding of this process of visualization, uh, the semantically meaningful models and so on, and how people understand data will outlast any single tool or platform. And so by understanding this, uh, we can hopefully set the groundwork for building the next generation of tools and platforms. So as an example, Sam has uh, spoken with a number of different researchers that look at how uh, clouds collapse, expand, uh, what ends up happening inside those clouds and how we can interpret that information. Uh, and then we uh, she's broken that down into a number of different fundamental steps. And it's from this set of fundamental steps that we hope to be able to uh, construct a grammar of data storytelling and uh, volumetric analysis. Now, Coupled with all of this is the notion that storytelling is not an act uh, that is done in isolation. Uh, drawing on the ontology, or the framework that uh, Kate McDowell uh, has described, um, we can think of three components in a data storytelling triangle, and we can reframe those inside the uh, context of analyzing data, and particularly how we can then abstract that for understanding how data analysis is, con is conducted independent of the field within which it is uh, it is initialized. So there are three components. There's the storyteller. So for instance, uh, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. There's the tale, uh, which is the underlying information uh, that is shared with us. And then there is the audience. And each one of these components has an independent relationship with the other components. So the story has a relationship with the storyteller. I am standing here, uh, there, is, there is a piece of software, for instance, that exists as a storyteller. It is querying the data, and then it connects with me, the audience of this data story. And it is through my relationship with the software that I understand it better and that I build my own independent relationship with an understanding of the underlying data. This triangle can guide us in how we think about the different processes and how to uh, guide our processes to maximize our ability to understand data. Um, there are, for instance, three different potential categories of visualization. Visualizations we make for ourselves, where we are talking directly to the teller. Visualizations we make for our peers, where we emphasize communicating information about the tale. And visualizations that we make for everyone else, we, where we emphasize uh, the told, the audience. We emphasize that as the key component of this. Um, and each of these brings with it different needs for narrative, interactivity, control, and the visual language. But what we've identified is we have identified essentially four different components of uh, data analysis uh, that we, we see in the natural sciences that are, uh, uh, roughly speaking, volumetrically organized. The process of registration, the process of transformation, the process of selection, and then the process of reduction. 
So for instance, registration is where data is laid out on disk in some manner that may or may not uh, correspond to the spatial organization or the physical meaning of what it represents. And we want then to be able to organize that into some sort of a logical structure where we can apply uh, information that relies on connectivity, position, and so forth. Uh, and then taking that logical structure, be able to map that into some form of a coordinate system where we have an actual spatial structure that corresponds to uh, a metric that we can then apply and can, uh, 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 calculate distances, for instances. Now, one key aspect of this is that with this registration, we can query fields at any specific location. We can define a function that uh, pr provides to us field values. Now, this can also be with discretely sampled data. Uh, so for example, you may have some data set that requires integration over multiple different nearby components in order to compute the value at any given location uh, with a smoothing kernel or something like that. The next phase uh, in our vocabulary of volumetric data analysis is that of transformations, where we store some subset of the variables that uh, exist in potentia on uh, disk, or we measure some subset. But from those, we can then uh, construct any number of fields that exist uh, in, in potentia. So by registering the data, we can combine things at fixed spatial locations with this closure function. So for instance, we might be able to apply an arithmetic manipulation to take two uh, X and Y, or to take an X field and a Y field for velocity, and then construct a velocity magnitude field from them. The velocity magnitude field does not exist on disk, but it exists uh, in uh, theory in potentia. The next phase is that of selection, where we can select uh, points based on either their characteristics or their uh, uh, positions in space. And so we can then apply this as some sort of geometric or non-geometric selector function that we can then utilize on our registered data in order to perform transformations uh, and then finally uh, reductions. Reductions are reductions along axes. So for instance, uh, integration along uh, an axis, uh, com connecting a path, uh, identifying a non-trivial manifold and doing uh, spatial remapping and so forth. For instance, this might be taking a uh, tracer particle and then evolving it through some calculation and then integrating all of the values along which it, uh, it progresses. This can also be, for instance, querying uh, a projection, so constructing simulated observations of galaxy clusters and so on, uh, where we uh, integrate along uh, a spatial plane and then construct a pixel plane that we can then use to, uh, to interpret. And then finally, all of these operations can be composed. Uh, so for instance, we can start with a whole bunch of bits on disk. We can compose them into a registered simulation uh, that, or a registered set of data that uh, has extent in three dimensions and position in three dimensions, um, which also then uh, we are able to select. So for instance, identifying uh, different regions that are overdense in dark matter or in baryonic matter uh, inside this galaxy cluster. Uh, to identify uh, dark matter halos, then taking those dark matter halos, uh, stripping them out, uh, and then remapping them into a new plane where we can conduct uh, you know, op uh, uh, reduced data analysis operations on them. We've implemented much of this inside a volumetric analysis platform called YT, uh, which is a Python, Cython, uh, and Rust package that, uh, well, not very much Rust, but uh, that builds out a high-level semantic method for querying fields and APIs that is independent of the underlying data representation on disk. So for instance, drawing from a couple dozen different uh, simulation codes, being able to read and spatially locate different data sets, uh, conduct analysis, visualization uh, on them. Uh, each one of these three images um, is conducted using a completely different method for data uh, analysis and simulation. So I'm sorry, uh, for data representation. So for instance, on the left, this is a uh, an Eulerian grid structure that's adaptive. In the middle is an adaptive Lagrangian Eulerian structure uh, that is essentially an unstructured mesh Voronoi tessellation. And then on the right, a mesh-free simulation using the Gamer2, Arepo, and Gizmo data outputs. And then utilizing this vocabulary of uh, volumetric data analysis, we are able to address these in a uniform way and construct plots that can be directly compared despite their myriad differences uh, in the, the data sets themselves. Um, 
We can also then uh, construct uh, analysis queries that are specific to the, the physical characteristics rather than computationally oriented systems uh, and abstract away all of the underlying data representation while still making it accessible if necessary. Um, largely, YT is used by Astro Simulators, but uh, it is increasingly now being used by material science, geophysics, uh, and geodynamics, and nuclear engineering, uh, and then a little bit in some other domains. Uh, we're working to uh, expand our understanding of these things, so specifically focusing on the story rather than the technicality, and that's how I think that the tools for data analysis across boundaries should be focused uh, in, in the future. And then how this seeps into our thinking about differential equations, simulation platforms, and the connection from data to knowledge to information to wisdom uh, in connection with theory. And then this allows us to address the boundaries between semantics and pragmatic applications. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Wow. <laughs> that, was, that was an amazing talk, Matthew. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, this is baffling. I, I really appreciate how, I mean, all the insight that you actually have to like reduce the, the problem down into these four components. And um, yeah, just, just the conciseness of that. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so just a reminder that we have a Q&A document. Uh, it's linked in the chat. Uh, I'll paste the link again once the, the chat scrolls too much, too, too high. Um, but yeah, you can ask the questions uh, or you can ask our speakers questions there and uh, they'll answer uh, offline. So is there any question for uh, Matthew that needs to be answered live in the session right now? Something pressing? Um, well, if that's not the case, um, then yeah, I would defer all the questions to the to the document and let's move on to Alexander's talk. Um, so Alexander Bock is a is a professor at uh, Lin Shuping University. He has a background in, in visualization and and data science and just the visualization with from multiple domains. Um, just just a really rich background that led to this this project. Um, open space and I'm really excited to uh, to have Alexander here because this is this is a really one of a kind project so um, hopefully we'll appreciate learning about this so thank you Alexander for coming and the stage is yours thank you Oscar thanks for the uh, very nice introduction so yeah as you said my name is Alexander Bock or Alex Bock I'm an assistant professor at Linköping University in scientific visualization and as my second hat, I'm wearing also the uh, the lead developer of the open space project. And my talk is basically about talking about the development of open space. And then hopefully if there's enough time to go into a bit of a demo afterwards as well. So it would be just fair to start with basically what open space is and how it started out. So it originates from a development between uh, Linköping University and the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which, uh, started as the foundation of wanting to do an open source software that can visualize everything in the universe. Um, so after a few years of that um, of development, we got a huge grant from, uh, from NASA to continue developing this because they got interested in um, using that as part of their STEM education. Uh, so that allowed us to get uh, New York University, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and the University of Utah on board with all of that as well. So now it's these five institutions that are forming the core of the development uh, of the software. And as I alluded to in the beginning, our goal is essentially to provide a contextualized environment where um, both developers, domain scientists and users can throw in all kinds of different data sets into one consistent framework. Um, so the usual way how I'm referring to that is that it's a game engine without any gameplay. So it, because it, a lot of the development is very, uh, adopted from, from, from game engines. And our scientific approach 
it's mostly focused on the visualization of, science, of space missions, so different spacecraft and how they do their observation schedules and so forth. Observations from both can be uh, from spacecraft and ground based, and also simulations that can be purely uh, purely virtual. And we target for our software a large a large array of potential display systems. So this would be uh, laptops on the one end, but then also planetariums and dome theaters on the very far other end. Um, then some of the ongoing work that is now currently um, prog slowly progressing is uh, support for VR environments, uh, tablets, different kind of gesture methods, and just other unique ways of interacting with the software, which might potentially be useful for novice users. And this all boils down to that we want to be a device for people to explore and explain data at the same time with the same software. And this kind of this slide illuminates exactly what we want to do. Um, so here we have um, um, a boy that was using our software and an exhibition in Brooklyn a couple of years ago. Uh, so he's holding a game controller and flying over Mars and looking at the mountain foundation formations and like like looking at the atmospheric model and so forth. So there's there's like a lot of like scientific research behind it to make the images that he's he's looking at, but he's looking at it from a point of view of being interested in it and hopefully he would take enough away from this experience to want to go into some kind of STEM field afterwards because we definitely need more of those people. But then uh, I think it was just a week or two weeks later, um, we had uh, Jack Mustard from Brown University uh, in New York, uh, who's on the science uh, definition team for the Perseverance rover. So about, as I said, what, like one to two weeks later, uh, we had him in the Hayden Planetarium in New York, here lying on the ground, looking at exactly the same software, pretty much exactly the same data, like he has, of course, some more more detailed data sets, but like it's it's the same kind of data, and looking at the potential landing sites uh, of Perseverance, and here we're looking at Jezero Crater where it's actually landed ultimately. So this kind of combination of exploring on your own and explaining to someone else is something that we're really really infused about. Uh, so infused, in fact, that um, my PhD supervisor in our group we now started to coin a new term, which is called exploration. No, one of the images disappeared. Um, but we can use the same software for other uh, elements as well. So here, for example, we're looking at the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in the back, um, one of the videos that I made for uh, Juna Kohlmeier, who's uh, in charge of the new, the new version of uh, this fantastic galactic data set. So covering all of these kind of different aspects is really what we're interested in. But however, this of course can't be done by ourselves. And as both of our previous speakers already mentioned, uh, we have a large team of, uh, um, of a steering committee at the top. We have developers in the middle, but then uh, nevertheless, or not, the most important parts of all of them are all of the students that are at the bottom. So um, we have a lot of the development that is happening in open space driven by um, computer science or media technology students here at the university who are doing their final year projects within open space. And many of the features that we have uh, originated as these thesis projects of just seeing what happens. And then it worked out and we developed it further as the main core development team. So that is uh, one, of the, one of the development avenues that we found very, very beneficial because it allows us to do um, very quick and rapid development. Uh, this one's mostly for the video for people if they want to stop. So we, of course, made a couple of papers and all of their thesis works. So if you're interested in it, just pause the video and jump, jump back to these slides. Um, but then for the for the open space software itself. So it all started back in basically like November, December 2013, uh, when the first lines of codes were written. And we're now a couple of years later, and we're supporting mainly Windows, but then also Linux and Mac OS where possible. Um, it's everything and it's mostly written in C++, um, limited to OpenGL 4.1, unfortunately. Uh, and we're using Lua as a scripting uh, language and in, the, in, the, in open space itself, but also as a configuration step outside. And it's a MIT license. So basically, it's a very free license that people can do with whatever they want, essentially, as long as they give us credit, which we also found very, very beneficial to get 
uh, external partners on board that might not necessarily want to share their own contributions um, back to the community. Of course, we prefer that, but well. So with that, we can we can generate, as I said, images on, on laptops. We have developed uh, touch interfaces for, for museums where people can explore the dynamics of the solar system, but then also, of course, planetar planetarium shows. Um, and we're actually in the process right now of finalizing our first pre-rendered planetarium show, which is also very, very exciting. But then nevertheless, of course, the missions, mission visualization, which started the whole endeavor from the beginning. And um, with all of this software and this, uh, this effort, we, uh, yeah, we're expanding into more and more planetariums around the world. So here's just a couple of them um, that are running open space on a, on a regular basis as interactive software to talk to the, to the general public. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges that are involved in this. I mean, this is probably not a surprise to anyone here, um, but given the, um, the amount of time that we have for the talks, I want to focus here on one of the aspects of these, um, which is the flexibility, because I think that's where having a software as open source really comes to shine, uh, that you can just give people like access to the guts under the hood and they can go in and tinker with it and do something that you as the main developer or even as a group of developers never even considered doing. And this is like one of those really nice elements of that, yeah, the, the warm and fuzzy feelings that you're gonna get uh, when someone does something very unex unexpected with your software, it's the first question. So this all boils down to us using Lua as a, as a, as a scripting interface. Um, we're using Lua because it's very easy to integrate. It runs decently fast or fast enough for our experiences and, um, we use it both as the, the method to generate, to put content into open space. So it defines how our scene graph works and so forth, but then also as a, as a configuration um, language. So for example, we can say like, oh, if I, con if I press control T, then execute this Lua script, which in this case makes the earth disappear. So all of our user interfaces uh, go through a Lua um, middleware which allows us to put pretty good constraints on what people can do, um, but then also enable people to break that if they really know what they're doing. And it's like, we're very much in the shoot yourself in the foot kind of mentality when those kind of things, if you know what you're doing, like you're very welcome to shoot yourself in the foot with our software. Another really interesting part of this is that we recently moved into the area where we connected Lua with a JavaScript interface. So that allows us to run external web pages that communicate directly with our software and can do other things that were previously impossible. So for example, we use this as our main uh, user interface. So the main user interface that you're gonna get when you're starting open space is actually a Chromium embedded framework web page that is rendering on top of everything, which also means that we can put that onto, a, onto an iPad control where someone is walking around in a planetarium and can steer the entire dome with their iPad without any problems because that's all like seamlessly handled by the, by the web browser. Or we can have specialized controls for, um, for pre-canned shows that they, they, where you know you want to move between different elements and uh, we can pre-generate pre quite complicated uh, scripts that get executed whenever you just press a single button. So that's it's also very, very useful. But then other, other partners have built their own entire user interfaces that are completely independent from what we ever thought about, uh, which again is kind of the point. And then lastly, um, this is one of the examples that really made me smile when I, when I realized that someone has done that. So natively in open space, we don't have the ability to do depth of field rendering. Um, mostly because doing that at real time is in a planetarium is kind of iffy to do that. But I got a message on Slack from one of our um, from, a, from one of our uh, users, and they were asking if it's possible to render out a depth image. And at the time it wasn't, but I sent him like a little diff of changing, like hacking some shader somewhere to just render it out as a, as a grayscale image. And then it took about three days or so, and I got this image back from him where he rendered the Apollo 11 landing site um, on, on his own completely with the really nice depth of field and changing depth of field value. And as I stated, like this still out of the box, it's not possible in open space, but it's only possible because the shaders are exposed 
And if someone really wants to, they can like hack it and do things with it. And I think that's the really, really nice part. But now let's, uh, in the last minute or two that I have, I just want to jump quickly between a few potential um, examples of data sets. So if I'm switching over here, I have to do that pretty quickly. So it's not actually the background. So we're having a bunch of different data sets in the system, um, different satellites that we can look at that are zooming around the Earth. They should, they should come across pretty, pretty decently. Um, can look at the GPS data set. So that's basically, this is an example of basically point-like data that is moving in time through our solar system. Now I need to actually, so I didn't prepare this properly. I need to bring up the user interface, which might actually be good as well. So if we're zooming over all the way to Mars, we can have another example of potential data sets, which is uh, surface, surface images. So if we're going down here, we can have a look at, in this case, Mars, looking at CTX images, which is six meter resolution uh, surface images of Mars and flying down to an area called Kandor Kasma, particularly southwestern Kandor Kasma. It's one of the examples where we have um, images from the high-rise camera, which is uh, 25 centimeters uh, resolution. So if I'm feigning that one in. So now we're looking at, I think it's in total about 50 terabytes, but of course it's a small data, a small subset of the data. But now we can fly over the area. And this is exactly the image that I was showing earlier where um, the boy was flying over and experiencing this on their own, like just downloading the data over the internet, which is really, really cool. But time constraints, we're leaving Mars pretty quickly behind us again. Not that far behind. So now we're looking at constellations in the background. And this is the last example that I want to show, which is again, point cloud data. But now everyone knows that the stars are at different distances from, from Earth. Um, and our ancestors have basically drawn lines between stars that look the same brightness to us. But of course, if you have two stars next to each other, they might have the same brightness to us, but that just might mean that one of the stars is double the distance, but also double the brightness. So if we're zooming out of our own solar system, we're able to see that, for example, in this case, in the, the Big Dipper, the stars of the Big Dipper are of quite different distances to us. And as we're zooming out, we can see how this hedgehog of lines is actually, all of our constellations are drawing, drawing lines between stars that are of vastly different distances. This is like one of the benefits of 3D visualization, uh, of being able to, um, to display all of this. So let me get rid of the constellations. And with that, I want to uh, to thank you all for this short presentation. Hope there, I'm going to have a look at the questions, but uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you very much again for inviting me. This was really, really cool. This is indeed really, really cool. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Wow. Um, what, a, what a system. I, I love this. Um, I have several questions um, and just just yeah, I would like to bask in this more, but uh, we need to move to uh, Jessica's talk uh, because she needs to leave uh, a lot of 15 sharp. Um, so how about uh, everyone who has a question, Alex asked it in the uh, Google document. I will link it uh, in chat again. And yeah, let's, uh, let's go to Jessica's talk right away. So, um, Hi, this is Jessica Canobar, and I'm a. Oh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to introduce Jessica, but I think she'll introduce herself. Um, sorry, I'm sorry. In any case, ahead. Jessica is. Before. Yeah, Jessica is. Uh, <laughs> so she's a, she's a researcher at, at UCSC. Uh, she studies marine biology and, and neuroscience. Um, there's just so much interesting work that Jessica has done in, in, these, in life sciences, especially on marine animals that. 
I can't possibly even go through it. What really stands out about her work, though, is that she not only does the science, but she does a ton of communication. And I mean, in all fronts, um, starting from just just drawn art, uh, she illustrated uh, entire books, in fact, um, making animations, making videos and, uh, or films, uh, photography. So Jessica has an amazingly kind of well-rounded approach to doing science and communicating science. And um, I think that's very important. So um, that's that's you know why uh, I'm really interested in her talk, and and hopefully we can make it through and answer a few questions before she has to leave. So yeah, let's let's start right away. Hi, my name is Jessica Kennelbar, and I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at UC Santa Cruz in ecology and evolutionary biology with Dan Costa and Terry Williams. I create devices to record brain activity in wild northern elephant seals as they dive over a mile deep in the open ocean. I want to start with a bit of background on how this project started and how it's brought all these people together. So in my first few years of grad school, I started working as a freelance designer, illustrator, and then animator in parallel with the research for my dissertation. At the intersection of art and science, I work with scientists to communicate their results to the public with infographics and animations. At the World Marine Mammal Conference in 2019, I went to a talk with over 100 audience members. They were all squinting their eyes and craning their necks to get a better view of a video of three humpback whales feeding together at the bottom of the ocean a previously undocumented and exciting collaboration between animals. Even as someone who knows what the inside of a whale's mouth looks like, this video was pretty hard for me to interpret, with the whales entering and exiting the view of the camera attached to the back of one of the whales. Through my work as an artist and through conversations with my brother, who's a visual effects programmer, I'd become aware of the huge range of sophisticated technical tools that are available to both filmmakers and animators. My brother's experience with coding tools using Python within Autodesk Maya, a 3D animation software, convinced me of the potential to integrate high resolution data into 3D animations. So I reached out to the presenter, a whale biologist named David Wiley, to see if he would want to collaborate on an animation to visualize this behavior. This first collaboration opened the door to several others with scientists who study the Northern Elephant Seal, which is the deepest diver among all seals and sea lions. They wanted to find a way to visualize the diving behavior of elephant seals alongside physiological parameters such as body composition and heart rate. One of my advisors, Terry Williams, studies these parameters in narwhals and she also wanted to create a similar animation. Through this work, I've discovered the incredible field of data visualization and met great collaborators like Angus Forbes of the Computational Media Department here at UC Santa Cruz. I'm really excited to attend IEEE this year and learn from you all about ways that we can integrate creative data visualization into marine mammal and wild animal biologging data. Our goals for this project were to collaborate with biologists to research how marine mammals' behavior and physiology changes when they're exposed to different types of disturbances, to ensure that each of those insights is communicated clearly through vis the visualization by combining narration and annotations with our 3D and line animations, to increase the reach readership and comprehension of scientific papers by creating accessible and engaging animations, and to work with scientists to develop clear and succinct takeaways that summarize the consequences of disturbance and provide conservation recommendations. Specifically, we paired and visualized data on diving behavior and physiology to generate hypotheses and compare results across animals and across timescales. 
ultimately generating evocative animations that would reach broad audiences and inform policy decisions. Our, overall, our creative pipeline includes an initial phase of conceptualization, followed by the creation of custom assets, data curation, where we process the raw data and integrate it into animations and sound, followed by final compositing and dissemination to reach those audiences and achieve desired outcomes. First, we sat down with each scientist to look at the data they have and the outcomes they'd like to achieve. For some, this can start as simply as fulfilling the broader impacts requirement of their grant. Um, or it could grow to include policy recommendations and public outreach. We draft a script that tells the story of the research and its implications. For example, our humpback animation shows the cooperative benthic foraging behavior of three whales and emphasizes how that behavior leaves the animals vulnerable to entanglement in bottom set fishing gear. Our next step included creating custom assets for use in our animations. In our humpback whale model, we modified the existing rig to add additional joints and create more fluid and flexible movement to accurately depict these animals' maneuvers on the sea floor. We also added controllers to be able to flexibly open the humpback's mouth and control the extent and duration of the mouth engulfment. For the elephant seal animation, we started with a rigged generic seal model and sculpted it to look more like a juvenile northern elephant seal. We created a 3D model of the biologging tag that was used to collect the video and motion data for the humpback whales. It shows the features of the tag, including the forward and backward facing cameras and the suction cups for attachment. We customized a model of a lobster trap by modeling a rope and buoys to demonstrate the process of ropeless fishing gear where a galvanic float release is activated that sends a set of buoys to the surface only once the trap is ready to be retrieved. We created a school of fish for the whales to feed on. Uh, this process demonstrates the 3D animation pipeline from beginning to end, where first we sculpt the fish from a few cylinders, paint a texture, apply that texture to the model, and then we created a skeleton and uh, connected the skeleton to rigged controllers and animated a swim cycle. We simulated schooling behavior using a MASH flight network in Maya, specifying the cohesion, attraction, and separation between individual agents. Then we connected the humpback whales as collision nodes so that the prey would avoid the whales. Finally, we built the underwater environment with a series of lights and textures using realistic water properties of red light attenuation, ocean depth, and wind speed parameters. Next, we worked to integrate five broad categories of data into our animations, large scale tracking data, diving behavior in 2D and in 3D, animal orientation, including pitch, roll, and heading, swimming and gliding behavior, and heart physiology. We created 2D line animations to visualize tracking data, dive profiles, and internal physiology in our 2D elephant seal animation, which pairs data on the position of the animal on the globe with its buoyancy over time. As the seals forage, they gain body fat, which eventually changes their buoyancy from negative to positive. Our paper demonstrates that the seals shift their resting behavior as a result of this internal change in body condition. We transformed raw data on the position and orientation of animals over time to represent them in space relative to one another. We used Python scripting in Autodesk Maya to set keyframes in three dimensions based on the data. Next, we added data-driven animation to represent swimming and gliding behavior. In order to create organic swim, an, an organic swim cycle that could be pulled into a central gliding position, we needed to create two independent controllers because the center keyframe of an offset swim cycle still has some degree of tail rotation. One swim controller sets the beginning and end of each swim cycle, while the other glide controller pulls the tail and pectoral flippers into a central location. 
While this animal shows, while, while this example shows swimming side to side, this could be modified for any other animation cycle, like a human walking or a bird flying. Next, we used our physiological data on heart rate to generate soundtracks. Because the heart rate of marine mammals is so variable, the heartbeat sounds must be played very precisely, going from above 140 or even 200 beats per minute in penguins, uh, down to 20 or even 2 beats per minute in this uh, case of the narwhal. We used a tool typically applied during neurophysiological playback experiments to make sure that we were presenting each heartbeat as precisely as possible. The end result is an animation that pairs behavior and physiology, helping us observe synchronous changes between behavior and heart rate, such as the decrease in heart rate after the animal leaves the surface, or the stroking and gliding it performs at the bottom of its dive, or the return to high heart rates at the end of the dive. The final step is to compile these rendered 3D animations with motion graphics and data sonification. Then we add narration and work with composers to create custom musical scores to accompany the shifts in data and the narrative arc of the animation. Then we share these animations in order to reach our audience and achieve desired science communication and conservation outcomes. As biologists, we're barely introduced to the field of data visualization and often use simple line graphs and scatter plots to discover patterns in our data, even when our data is inherently multidimensional. We might be introduced to more complex data visualization as an end product to display our analyses or communicate a result to the public, but very rarely do we use data exploration during research. While there are some Powerful tools for visualizing underwater behavior like TrackPlot developed by Colin Ware. These platforms don't yet pair behavioral data with physiological data streams. We would like to continue this work by developing and streamlining these tools and eventually build a platform for visualizing and comparing data on diving physiology across multiple study systems, including seals, whales, penguins, and maybe even humans. We believe that by leveraging powerful industry animation tools, we can create visualizations that expedite research, promote conservation, and foster empathy and compassion with the natural world. Please reach out if you'd be interested in collaborating on these projects with us in the future. This is beautiful work, Jessica. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, so we are five five minutes um, till Jessica has to leave, and I think ten minutes till everyone has to leave. So, are there any any outstanding questions for Jessica from the audience? Um, well, actually, um, we have one from Alex in the Google Doc. So I'll just ask that. Um, what drove your, your use of Maya for the data visualization? Uh, was it the tool that everyone was familiar with, or uh, did you just provide some other tangible benefits that, that you went for it? Uh, yeah, so uh, mostly what drove my use of Maya um, for the animations was uh, that my brother, um, who works in computer graphics, um, he is an experienced Python programmer for tools for artists in Maya. Um, and he was the one who you know, told me that it was possible to put data directly into 3D animations. Um, and uh, the only thing is he has limited time um, <laughs> because he has a whole job. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time on YouTube learning 3D animation skills, um, but I'm really interested in having mentorship uh, in 3D animation. And um, I think what uh, I, I forget, I think it was in Alex, um, Alex's talk. Um, I'm interested in creating sort of like a game engine for data visualization of marine mammal um, diving data that is, you know, maybe the user can swim around uh, an animal, but I want the the animal itself to be uh, data driven 
Um, and uh, if anyone knows the best tool to do that, I'm very motivated to learn the skills um, to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. Um, I can totally imagine the open space, the open space being extended to underwater. I mean, I'm led to believe that there is options on different uh, moons and perhaps planets, maybe not in the solar system, but in on the moons, yeah. So maybe there is a there's a form of life there that could be fluidly blend blended into as you zoom across space in open space. Um, yeah, I mean this is this is um, this amazing work, and I really both for open space and for your work, Jessica. Um, by the way, do you have a code name for for the the pipeline or for the the yeah, ecosystem? Yeah, it's called the uh, visualizing life in the deep. Um, but but I think I, this is just an amazing workshop. Thank you for putting to, it together because basically what we're interested in in growing over time, and this may take you know my entire career. Um, but I would love to have a comparative portal where you can use tools similar to, to the Xena interface to compare human, um, human clinical data about sleep apnea and dive-related trauma and, um, and epilepsy even to compare it to marine mammals um, to, to enable comparative physiology studies. Um, and I would love to make 3D game engine portals um, and and it'd be able to explore the underwater environment too. Um, so I'm really happy to connect to all of you people with skills that I admire. Um, and I'm I'm happy to be the scientist domain expert that you ask questions to. <laughs> wow. Well, we're very grateful for that. And I totally agree. I mean, we're almost out of time, actually one minute. Um, and I think this is, I mean, I had the I had the timeline in my mind which completely broke down clearly like there was supposed to be half an hour for all of us to discuss which just vanished um but it just shows that there is a lot to to talk about um i mean to me there is so many different lessons from each of these uh approaches or ecosystems that that we could learn from each other and it's very clear to me that we are just you know scratching um scratching the surface so to say um so yeah, I, I I will keep thinking about this. How can we how can we scale this up to to maybe a bigger platform or you know just to have more time for for talking about this? I think we could easily fill uh, you know an hour and a half of uh, of more airspace and maybe even more. Um, so in any case, this this workshop happened uh, as a very very quick thing, and I I am incredibly grateful to all four of you to uh, for coming and and giving these amazing talks which which would you know stand the test of any conference and or venue um so thank you for your uh, professionalism and yeah kind of starting the discussion i mean i am just starting with incros and uh, so these these symposia are going to happen every year so next time i'll definitely <laughs> Um, try to reserve more time for all these. Um, I, just posted, case, we'll... I just posted a note that we would definitely be happy as Cross to um, uh, post another one even sooner than next year if we want to have a separate one just on, on this subject to continue the conversation. Okay, well, that's, that's really great. And uh, yeah, so we'll keep the, the Google document open. Uh, I know Jessica has to literally take off um, on, on the on the ship but um the document will be there even after the fact so um you know feel free to to come back to it and um we'll see what we can do maybe we can compile these answers into something more comprehensive i'll definitely post them on the web page of the symposium uh, sorry of the workshop along with the uh recording of the session so it will be available there and we can take it take it from there thank you very much um, Thank you, Jessica, and okay. thank you, Alex, and Matthew, and Jing, for giving these amazing talks. Uh, if you're still with us, feel free to come and come. Um, and yeah, so, uh, Stephanie, how are we looking with time? We need to evacuate.
Um, I, I need to stop in like two minutes so that I can move over to the other session in time, but um, uh, which closes this okay. room <laughs> which unfortunately closes this room Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I well, think I think this has been fantastic. Clearly, there's different people who've worked on these, you know, very extensive open source projects for many years, and there must be some best practices that we could share amongst each other and to other people working at the intersection of visualization and software design, project design, and uh, and data science. So, yeah, I, I am. I think this is great that we're starting to talk even amongst uh, across different domains, and you know, move across boundaries. So thanks for everyone for coming. And I, yeah, I hope we have a chance to follow up soon. Any closing words from our speakers before we bail? I, I would say even that we need to particularly cross those boundaries. I think it's not in spite of all of our different fields. It's like, I think particularly in the intersection of all of these fields, that's where we can really benefit everyone, I think. And yeah, thanks again for organizing all of this. This was super great. <laughs> Glad to. All right. Um, well, Matthew just disappeared. Jink is gone. Okay, well, that's it then. Thank you everyone for, for coming again and see you next time. Keep bridging the boundaries. <laughs>